go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Ashley Deasing. I am the Director of Strategic Programs at the Board of Trade. Um, thank you all for joining. Thank you to our speakers and Kaiser and, and everyone for being here today. Um, I want to make sure everyone has plenty of time to ask your questions and leave here well informed. Um, I just want to give a very quick background on why we're here. Um, at the beginning of the year, the Board of Trade stood up a cross-sector regional vaccine information task force, which is made up of about 30 individuals who are at the front lines of both the public health response and pandemic-related business hardships. Um, and through our discussions, we really determined an important near-time role would be for us to help educate the business community on vaccine information, legal and HR issues, and why the vaccine program is so critical to economic recovery. This is our fourth town hall in a series we've developed in partnership with the chambers across the region in an effort to reach deeper into the business community. And I'd like to thank all the chambers for their leadership uh, throughout the last year and certainly our longstanding collaborative partnership uh, with the Board of Trade. So let's get started. Today, I am pleased to welcome our panelists and our moderator. Um, for the discussion. Uh, Dr. Darren Young works in the Department of Adult and Family Medicine in the Mid-Atlantic Permanente Medical Group at Kaiser Permanente. He's a board certified internal medicine physician. After he completed his residency in 2019, Dr. Young joined Mid-Atlantic Permanente Medical Group where he sees patients, mentors physicians new to the practice and teaches rotating medical students from George Washington University. Uh, we have Chuck Walters here with us. He's a senior counsel for labor and employment with Kaiser Foundation Health Plan. Uh, his work covers the full range of labor and employment law responsibilities with an emphasis on labor law matters. Chuck also has 22 years of experience in the private sector where he counseled and represented a wide variety of local and national clients in all aspects of labor and employment law. And moderating today's discussion, we have Michael Aiken, who's the president of Link Strategic Partners, which is a strategic communications, stakeholder engagement, and social impact consulting firm in DC. And Michael also serves as the chair of our vaccine information task force. Uh, the panel today will walk through some facts about COVID and the vaccine, some specific scenarios and best practices to note as most of us are returning to in-person work. And just a few housekeeping items before we get going. Uh, we intentionally wanted this to be an intimate group. Um, we encourage you to ask your questions throughout. This is not a webinar, clearly. Uh, it's a forum for you to get your questions answered. So make sure you use the raise your hand feature or the chat box, or you can wait until about 2.15 when we open up for Q&A. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Michael. Thank you so much, Ashley, and thanks for all your work in pulling these together. The Board of Trade's done a number of these, and I know they've been really helpful. So you've got the well-respected physician, you have got the accomplished attorney, and then you've got the consultant. And my job is to keep us walking through the questions today. Um, we've got some questions that were pre-submitted, and we've got some questions from other town halls we've done. So I'll start by uh, with a physician asking some medical-related questions, then we'll move on to some of the legal-related questions. Feel free, as Ashley said, at any point to use the chat box or the radio hand and we'll make sure we get your questions in as well and we'll also keep time at the end for that so looking forward to a good discussion dr young let's start with what is a simple but also a very large question why do you think it's important for individuals to get vaccinated yes yeah, so i think all of us would agree that you know mid 2020 up until now has been very challenging for us in terms of how radically our lives have changed with respect to things that we take for granted, doing so normally, going out to restaurants, going shopping, um, things of that nature. And it's been a strain these past year plus trying to adjust to life through the pandemic. Um, fortunately, back in uh, the end of 2020, early 2021, we have developed several vaccines that have enabled us to develop protection and immunity against COVID-19. And the reason that I would recommend all individuals to get vaccinated is because of the safety and efficacy that's been proven through all of the vaccines that are authorized through um, the United States by the FDA. Um, the vaccines that we have available uh, through the trials that we have conducted so far have been proven to be safe and effective. Um, we have over 151 million Americans that are fully vaccinated. We have over 170 million Americans that have received their first dose of the vaccine. 
And, you know, it's very important to get vaccinated to help protect our community, our loved ones, friends and family. So, um, and help us to return to a sense of normalcy. Thank you, doctor. And, you know, words are thrown around a lot, like we need to reach herd immunity or community Im immunity. And I don't think we spend a lot of time unpacking what that means and why that's important. So can you talk to us a little bit about that? What is that, uh, herd or community immunity and why does that matter as we're trying to combat this going forward? Sure. Herd immunity is a term that's used in the medical field to kind of indicate a sense of immunity throughout the broader community against a particular disease state. Um, we often mention herd immunity in the cases of uh, certain infections like measles, um, but pertinent to coronavirus, um, herd immunity is obviously talked about a lot um, because it's an important point for us to sort of unofficially say we can safely return to a sense of normalcy. Now, with respect to the coronavirus infection, herd immunity is accomplished in one of two ways, either through natural infection by the virus or through vaccination. Um, like I mentioned earlier, so far we have over 150 million Americans fully vaccinated, over 170 million first doses administered. Um, and so far public health experts are mentioning 70% immunity as the benchmark for us to sort of be able to return to a sense of normalcy fairly safely. Got it. That, that makes sense. And it's that would be 70% across the population, right? Not in any specific age groups, but across the population. Correct. Correct. I want to jump in um, to, to safety. And I know safety is a big topic, but I think the, the question is we've done community engagement around the country on this issue. There's, there's what I would call healthy hesitation, right? There's the, this is new. I want to make sure I understand it before I get it injected into my body. So talk to us a little bit about the safety piece and how the vaccines actually work. Sure. So like I mentioned earlier, we currently have three vaccines that have been authorized by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, for emergency use authorization in the United States. That would be the uh, Pfizer biotech vaccine, Moderna vaccine, and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, now, these vaccines are slightly different, um, particularly the uh, Pfizer biotech and the Moderna vaccines. Those are classified as mRNA vaccines, which is relatively new technology. Um, they have been proven to be safe and effective. Um, we say new, it's kind of come to rise over the past 20 years or so. And that technology has enabled us to uh, manufacture and mass produce these vaccines on such a large scale for distribution. Um, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is slightly different. Um, that's classified as something that we call a viral vector vaccine. Um, and just getting to the specifics on how these vaccines work, um, the mRNA vaccines contain the genetic material from the COVID-19 virus. And that genetic material is uh, in, injected into our bodies um, and picked up by the cells of our immune system. And then the cells of our immune system use their materials to develop a spike protein that enables us to recognize the COVID-19 virus should we ever come encounter with it. And we'll sort of have an immune response pre-mounted due to the vaccine. Johnson & Johnson vaccine is very similar, although it differs in the way that the genetic material is delivered to our immune system. Um, since it's a viral vector, it uses a weakened form of a virus. Uh, it's important to note that this is not the COVID-19 virus, it's a different virus that carries that genetic material from COVID-19 into our cells. Um, like I mentioned, so far, the data that we have seems to suggest that the Vaccines are both very safe and effective. Um, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines seem to have somewhere around 93 to 95% effectiveness once full vaccination and immunity is required. Johnson & Johnson protection is around 80% after full immunity based on our limited studies. Um, in terms of the most common side effects that are experienced, most people will experience some localized uh, pain, swelling, itching, redness at the injection site, might have some muscle aches, headaches, back aches, fatigue, low grade temperatures. Um, the most, uh, uh, I guess, unsafe uh, events that have been encountered so far, um, so far, 
like all vaccines, there are instances of anaphylaxis that had been reported. These are very rare. Uh, the data seems to suggest anywhere from three to five cases per million doses of vaccine administered. Um, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine in particular has gotten a lot of attention. There have been several reports of blood clots um, that have been reported in some people who have received this. Um, and then there are some uh, other reports of uh, myocarditis or inflammation of the heart that have been experienced after some uh, administrations of the vaccine, particularly in the younger population between the ages of 16 to 24. I know that was a lot there, but it's important not to shortchange that and really get into it. Um, I know at the beginning of the pandemic, when the vaccine started becoming available, a lot of the guidance was get whatever one's available. Do you sense now that, you know, people can ask for the one they want? So if you might be hesitant over here, you can just ask for a different one, or is it still kind of get whatever one you, you've got access to? Yeah, I think most often now, I think there's such a large availability of the vaccine since we're still making a strong push to reach herd immunity. Yeah. I think the it's a lot more liberal in terms of people's ease of selection of certain vaccines. Um, you are correct that earlier on, it was kind of just whatever we can put in your arm, just take yeah. it. But um, I think we've reached a point where it's a lot easier to select which kind of vaccine you've had, you would like if you have a preference. Got it. And then, you know, the headline is get the vaccine. It's safe. You also used words like genetic makeup and and we we used to vac uh, uh, um, a weakened virus. But I also heard you say we're not in we're not injecting you with COVID-19. So that's a fair statement. Correct. That's very important to note. We're not yeah. injecting any form of COVID-19 virus other than the genetic material that our cells use to uh, mount an immune response. And just with one of the things that have been circulating out there, when you say genetic materials, nothing in here is changing your actual DNA, correct? Correct. That's also very important to note. That is a myth that our genetic material gets altered. Um, the genetic material of the COVID-19 virus is uh, RNA-based. Our genetic material is DNA-based. So there's no influence or change of genetic material or makeup whatsoever. I think I'm getting a medical course here. This is really helpful. <laughs> Thank you for, for going into that. The other thing I just want to highlight that you said is that even though these seem new, because we're talking them a lot, they're based on the, the technology that's been studied for 20 plus years that got us to this point. And I, in a lot of our community engagement, people have said, well, how did we suddenly have this technology in 10 months that we never had before? And it's because we've studied to get to this point for over 20 years. Is that a fair way to say that? Correct. Correct. Do these vaccines cost anything if a patient's coming in? Nope. Well, we sort of paid for them with our tax dollars. So we've all already paid for them. So you might as well get one since you had, you know, some hand in paying for it. But no, you don't have to pay any fee. Um, they're absolutely free to the public. So everyone should be able to get one as long as they seek out, you know, a local pharmacy or something like that. Now, if you've already had COVID, um, are you supposed to get the vaccine? Yes, very important to note as well. So previous infection with COVID-19 does offer some level of protection against COVID-19, although there's two important things to note about that. One, the protection and immunity that's offered from natural infection is generally temporary in nature. Um, some estimates say it can last anywhere from up to six months to 12 months. So um, that immunity does eventually wean off. So it is important to get vaccinated to maintain that protection. Second thing that's very important is coming to uh, uh, relevance a lot more, uh, freak, uh, more uh, sooner uh, in today's news is that you're hearing about the rise of these variant strains of COVID-19, uh, particularly the UK strain, the South African strain, things of that nature. Um, the vaccines that we have available right now, uh, the data seems to suggest that there is some level of protection against those variant strains, that natural infection from the common COVID-19 strain that's been encountered throughout the United States does not offer. So as we're seeing rises of the Delta variant of the COVID-19 infection, it is very important to get vaccinated, even if you have previously been infected, to offer yourself and the community the most protection. And once you've gotten the vaccine, can you get COVID? And if you get COVID after you've gotten it, does that change anything? So although you are protected um, significantly, it is still technically possible to get COVID-19. Um, if you do uh, contract COVID-19, uh, the belief is that hopefully 
since your immune system does recognize the virus, it should be an attenuated response. So um, a lot of the data seems to suggest that the vaccine does protect against severe infection. And so you may have mild symptoms that would not otherwise be experienced were you not uh, vaccinated. Got it. So you could still get it rare cases, but if you do, the symptoms would be generally less uh, impactful because of it. Correct. And then once you get it, are you permanently immune or does it, do you have to get it again in the future? So that's another very good question, Michael. The data is still out on that. The, the verdict is still out on that one. We're continuing to conduct phase three trials into the vaccine efficacy and the uh, duration of immunity. Um, early studies seem to suggest that we may need a booster dose at some point. Um, the timeline for that isn't entirely clear. Um, it could be anywhere from a year after our initial vaccination. So we're, we're continuing to await studies and trials that are being conducted to determine the duration of immunity and when it might be the best time to get uh, a repeat booster dose. Got it. And needing to get it again certainly doesn't indicate it's not working. We get lots of vaccines, you know, multiple times to make sure they're working. Is that a fair way to look at that? Correct. Yeah. I mean, it's recommended to get the flu shot every year. Um, we have to get the tetanus shot uh, every 10 years. So just because we have to repeat it doesn't mean that it doesn't work, but uh, immunity can wane uh, over time. So it's important that we get revaccinated to maintain that protection. Excellent. I know there's been a lot of guidance over the past few months about masks and, and social distancing and all of that. What is the current guidance around masks and social distancing for vaccinated individuals? So you have the shot. What should you do now? Yes, very, very good question, because this has caused a bit of confusion. You know, the 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 CDC made an announcement uh, almost a month or so ago that fully vaccinated individuals no longer need to wear masks. Um, on the basis of the recommendation by the CDC, that is true by and large. Um, I do wanna make several um, statements in regard to that. Um, I would generally uh, recommend that all individuals uh, who are fully vaccinated may safely discontinue wearing masks and practicing social distancing practices so long as they're low risk individuals. Um, low risk individuals include everyone below the age of 65, anyone without any pre existing health conditions such as chronic lung disease, chronic heart disease, cancer, any immunosuppressive state, um, diabetes, and obesity. Those tend to be higher risk conditions that uh, predispose individuals to severe infection uh, from COVID 19. Um, so sort of pivoting to those higher risk individuals who are fully vaccinated. The CDC does say that it may be safe for them to discontinue. I would recommend whenever in a public setting or congregating with uh, unvaccinated individuals, for those high risk individuals, it still would be prudent in my, uh, in my best interest to uh, continue to wear a mask and to continue to practice safe distancing. Um, just because they are at higher risk for severe infection. Um, it's also very important to note that even though the CDC says that it may be safe, um, we still have to abide by uh, federal, state, local laws, uh, regulations, uh, uh, ordinances, um, and that it's still mandatory by and large to wear a mask so long as you're using public transportation, such as uh, travel by bus, travel by train, um, or traveling by airplane. Got it. Now, what about the opposite of that? So if you're unvaccinated or if you're a child who's not been able to get vaccinated, what's the, the guidance around masks and distancing? If you're unvaccinated, you should still continue to wear your mask and practice safe distancing. Even in individuals who receive the first dose of a vaccine, um, I would still continue to recommend that you wear your mask and practice safe distancing until you have reached full immune status which is defined as two weeks following the second dose of either the Pfizer or COVID, I mean, uh, Moderna vaccine, or two weeks following the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Got it. So two weeks after your last dose, you're, you're, you're much more protected. But if you're unvaccinated or if you're a child who's not been able to, you should still mask and you should still distance. Or if you've not reached fully immune status, correct. Or if you're a high-risk individual. Perfect. That, that mm -hmm. level of clarity is really, really helpful. Um, What's your advice um, 
uh, around masking and social distancing if you're in a group that has a little bit of both. Some people are vaccinated, some aren't, or, or we don't know because it's a public setting. What's the guidance around that? Sure. So I still recommend the same guidelines in terms of wearing masks. If you are fully vaccinated, it's been two weeks following your last dose of the vaccine, and you are a low risk individual, you don't have any high risk health conditions, such as chronic lung disease, chronic heart disease, cancer, any immunosuppressive condition. By and large, I believe that it is safe to practice discontinuation of mask wearing and discontinuation of social distancing, whether you're in a crowd of mix of vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals, um, indoors or outdoors. If you are fully vaccinated, but you do have a high risk health condition, I still strongly recommend that you speak with your primary care doctor, um, still take steps to protect yourself because you are at risk for severe infection. So if you're going to a public setting, you're going into a crowd of a mix of vaccinated, unvaccinated individuals, it still would be most prudent to wear a mask and practice safe distancing um, because you are at risk for transmission of COVID-19. And then if you are not fully vaccinated, it has not been two weeks following your last dose of the vaccine, or you have not received any doses of the vaccine, um, it is best to wear a mask and continuing to practice social distancing uh, when in a mixed crowd. Got it. So the single most important thing you can do is get vaccinated, lower your risk, and then beyond that, layer in the masks and the social distancing, depending on your risk factors, et cetera. Correct. I think so much of this comes down to just giving people the grace to figure out their, you know, their scientifically guided best decision for them we have a three-year-old, he still wears a mask. It's often easier for my wife and I who are fully vaccinated to also wear a mask to get a three-year-old to also do it. Anyone who has a three-year-old will understand why it's easier if we just all do it. And so I think it's, it's about you know keeping, keeping your family as safe as possible using the tools you have. So I appreciate that guidance. Um, what are some steps, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll end this on this, and then we'll, we'll see if folks have questions in the chat and we can come back to you after our next speaker if folks do. But last question for me, what are some steps that an employer can take to protect unvaccinated or otherwise at-risk workers in their workplaces? We're joined by a lot of people today who work in a business setting. This, these were put together through the Board of Trade and different chambers around the area. So what, what advice would you give to employers about how to best keep their employees safe, especially if they're unvaccinated or at higher risk? Mm -hmm. So if I haven't been clear enough in terms of my emphasis to push for vaccination, number one, I would recommend everyone to get the vaccine. Um, that's the best way to protect yourself against uh, infection from COVID-19. Um, but other things that we've been doing throughout the pandemic to sort of, you know, get to the point of the vaccine being developed, continuing to wear your mask is a very important uh, part of this. Um, that's the best way to protect yourself in addition to social distancing practices, allowing for at least six feet between yourself and others, um, sometimes physical barriers, whether it be uh, closed off spaces and things like that may be helpful to uh, separate people from congregating too closely. Um, continuing to practice good hygiene, so washing your hands regularly. Um, monitoring yourself for any symptoms. If you have any symptoms that are concerning for COVID-19, like fever, cough, shortness of breath, um, things of that nature, um, being mindful of that and sort of, you know, making your workplace aware so that they can do their best to um, protect everyone in the same workplace. Um, and if you do have a cough, you know, practicing good habits, like covering your mouth and things like that. Um, those are the biggest things that I would strongly recommend for employers as they're providing guidance for employees returning back to the workplace. And, you know, hopefully we can continue to make a push for herd immunity, get everyone vaccinated and back to a sense of normalcy soon. Thank you, doctor. That was really helpful and very clear. So I appreciate the, the clarity in your answers. I think so much, so much stuff has been communicated over the last year. It's, it's easy to just tune it out at some point. So it's really great to have that level of clarity. I wanna make a pivot um, continuing in the employer space over to Mr. Walters. Thank you for joining us today. We've got a, a similar number of questions for you. And if anyone watching has questions, please drop them into the chat box. So let's start at the employer level. Can an employer require employees to receive the, uh, the COVID-19 vaccine? So the short answer is that yes, uh, assuming you're, by the way, don't have a union representing your employers. If you do have a union, then you know, you'd have to bargain with the union over how you do that. But the short answer is yes, you can require it, 
but but there's a large but that comes with that. Um, there are exceptions that employees can invoke to to actually getting the vaccine. Uh, the first one is for employees who have medical conditions that would qualify as a disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act or the local law. And the second is for sincerely held religious beliefs or observance under uh, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act or the, or the state law equivalent. So you can require it, but you will have to um, consider making you know, what are called reasonable accommodations to employees who come forward and would and have a religious or medical basis to, to do that. Uh, one thing I'll say, say also is the uh, United States Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, EEOC, has a very robust website that is updated every few months um, on what, what its position is around all the labor, uh, mostly employment law um, issues involving COVID. And since the EEOC enforces all these civil rights laws, um, that's a very valuable website. They've done a great job of updating it. It's been updated in the last month as well, particularly regarding vaccines. Um, oh, I'm, sorry. Sec, I'm sorry, uh, I, I was just gonna make a, a couple more points. Um, if you are going to mandate vaccines, you need to do it with eyes open because there have been multiple lawsuits filed against employers who have done this. Uh, some of them have made the press. Uh, there was a very big decision down in Texas, uh, a favorable decision for employers upholding a hospital system's right to require vaccination. But there are actual law firms out there, so-called anti-vax law firms that are very eager to represent employees who are challenging their employers who do this. Um, so, it's not an easy determination whether you're going to require it or not. So, you know, I encourage all employers to, to seriously consider the costs and the benefits of doing it. So taking that a step further, we've talked about mandating or not. Can, can you ask, can an employer ask that, um, employees if they've been vaccinated or require proof of vaccination? The good news is that yes, you can. Uh, and that's specifically addressed in the EEOC uh, guidance that was issued on, on May 28th. Um, of course, if you, if you do, it, when you ask and when you also, if you obtain a pr proof of vaccination, uh, it's important to treat that as medical information, which has to be treated confidentially like any other medical information you would have regarding the, the employee. So. Yes, you can ask. Yes, you can. You can require proof, but you need to to treat the information you receive with the same protections you would you would treat uh, any other medical information from an employee. So based on your experience in this space, what would you advise employers around employees who don't want to get the vaccination? So I th I think you want to be careful. Um, as compared to simply, you know, saying, look, it's required if you don't do it, you know, I'm sorry, you're not gonna be able to, to, to work here anymore. Um, yeah, as I already mentioned, there are exceptions for medical conditions and for certain religious beliefs. So I think it's important to understand and really talk to the employee to find out what's their basis for not wanting to get a vaccination. Um, there, it, it could be, it could be, you know, lack of knowledge because not, you know, not everybody knows as much as Dr. Young was just sharing. Um, it could be, it could be um, legal reasons. Again, the disability, the religious accommodation. Um, it could be something we don't even know. So, so I think it's important to, if you don't know, if the employee doesn't come forward and say, hey, I don't want to get it because. I have a medical condition, I believe it's a disability, I have an obligation to accommodate me if they just simply are hesitant or they're stalling or they say they don't wanna get it. I think you really wanna have a discussion with that employee where possible, obviously, to, you know, if you have uh, 200,000 employees, you know, that's trickier, right? Those are local level conversations, but um, uh, talk to them. 
as a starting point. And, and I know uh, uh, your guidance is, is so prudent. Like have the discussion, see where you can find a, agreement. Just so we have it, can you terminate an employee if they refuse to get vaccinated? Yeah, so, you know, in, uh, I don't want to get too philosophical, but, you know, for most employees are at-will employees, so sure, you can go ahead and terminate them. The question is, is it prudent to do it? Is it legally prudent to do it? And as a business uh, action, is it prudent? You know, it'd be a shame to terminate someone who doesn't want to get a vaccine, but actually with a little more information is more than happy to get a vaccine because they're getting bad information yeah. uh, or they don't have any information. So uh, given how I would say charged, you know, politically, culturally, even legally, uh, vaccinations are particularly mandating vaccinations for your employees. Um, again, I, I think taking a step back and thinking, okay, the employee doesn't want to get it. What should I do? And if they continue to refuse, you know, really think about, you know, is termination the last resort? Because frankly, I think termination really should be more of a last resort mm -hmm. um, instead of just, just a knee-jerk reaction because they're not doing what you tell them they have to do. I want to stay on the requirements piece for a second, and we'll broaden this. If you're a private business, how does this impact customers? Can you require your customers to show proof of vaccination? So actually, you can, unless you happen to be in the state, and I'm only aware of one at the moment, uh, which is Texas, that actually has passed a state law banning that requirement um, or banning what are what are called uh, the vaccine passports. Um, but there are states, um, not in the DMV, uh, I will say, but states around the country that are, um, are you know, have introduced legislation to, to disallow um, companies from requiring this of customers. Yeah. There are so many of these questions, you know, it, it is a charged environment. And some of these come from wanting to keep people safe, but they also often come from a place of liability. So can you talk to us a little bit about what liability considerations employers should be thinking about regard to employees or customers who might contract COVID-19 in a business setting? Absolutely. And, and I've dealt with a few of these cases, I will say, in the past year and a bit. Um, the first thing I'll just say generally, it's very difficult to prove how someone contracted COVID, um, particularly you know, being able to establish that someone was infected at work. Because frankly, you know, as I don't think I'm, 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 I'm speaking out of school here, but community spread is really, you know, I think has been the biggest risk. So it's important to, to understand that, that you may not know that whether someone truly contracted COVID at work. You may have someone who's positive uh, and then someone else is positive, but, but that doesn't mean that, that anyone else uh, actually, actually, um, uh, contracted it there. Uh, it's very important to, especially here um, in, in, in the DMV, to, to make sure that you have a proper um, COVID safety standard and protocol in place. Both Maryland and Virginia, and Virginia was the first state in the nation to actually do this, they have issued their, their own um, COVID safety standards. And you know, if you're an employer with employees in Maryland or Virginia, uh, you need to make sure that you, you are in full compliance with that and you've documented the compliance. OSHA, uh, which is the federal agency that, that uh, enforces uh, workplace safety for all states in America, actually just issued a temporary emergency guidance that also provides guidance to, to employers when it comes to COVID. So you wanna know what you are expected to do and make sure that you are doing it. Um, if someone, if one of your employees is infected with COVID, everyone has a workers' compensation policy and carrier, you wanna contact them and work with them to deal with any, any potential workers' compensation coverage. Uh, 
which would mean that they had contracted it at work. In, term, in terms of customers, um, every, every company will have a essentially a premises liability or general liability insurance policy. Um, you want to know what it says, and if anything happens, you certainly want to uh, reach out to your, um, your, your insurance provider as well. Uh, in terms of what you require of customers, you know, if you want to require all your customers or, you know, if you're not a retail outlet, if you want to require um, visitors and guests to wear masks because, you know, you think that's the safest thing to do, you know, I, I think you should do it. Um, it. It might be easier than trying to, you know, rely on people to, to do, you know, do it on an honor system. Um, and also, you know, continue to track, I think, the CDC guidance um, in terms of what precautions employers should take at work, uh, particularly regarding uh, employees and um, any guests that come on the property. That is all really helpful. You talked about workers' compensation a bit. Can you talk a little bit about paid leave? If an employee is exposed to COVID or has COVID, are employers required to provide paid leave to those employees? All right. So... This is a little um, this is a little confusing in the in the uh, D.C. Maryland area. Um, so the the federal law, a lot of folks may remember the I think it was the FFCRA is the acronym. Um, you know, was very quickly enacted, and that did have paid leave for employers who had 500 or fewer employees. That has expired. So. There's no federal law that says you have to provide paid leave to someone who's uh, COVID positive or you know in a COVID protocol because they may have been exposed. Maryland, uh, within the last month, uh, actually passed a law, the Essential Workers Protection Act, that has has some very interesting, fairly onerous, frankly, provisions to to employers regarding. Um, actions they have to take during a public health emergency. Um, one of them does involve paid leave. Interestingly, um, and this sort of falls in the realm of, I guess, legislative political maneuvering, um, the, the requirement for the paid leave for certain types of employees, these are essential workers, uh, during a public health emergency, um, that paid leave mandate will only be enforced when funding has been authorized to pay for it and the funding has not yet been authorized. So unfortunately, folks will have to uh, rely on their government relations um, people to sort of keep track of what happens in Maryland. So again, this is a Maryland law. Uh, DC actually has an unpaid leave law. So to be clear, it's unpaid leave. Um, it was an amendment to its, its uh, regular unpaid leave law. Um, and, and that requires unpaid leave through the end, of, um, end of the public health emergency, which right now in, in DC has been extended to July 25th. So the short answer with apologies for giving a longer answer is it looks like only Maryland could potentially, but not now, require paid leave for the circumstances you uh, asked about. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walter. I, I'm going to ask one more kind of, I guess, liability-related question, and then we'll, we'll wrap up on some guidance for employers as they're welcoming employees back. So if you're an employer and you have a, a coworker who is tested positive, can you tell your employees that? Are you required to tell your employees if someone is tested positive? Or what advice would you have around that? Uh, do not do that um, because that, that will, um, in, in addition to, to legal prohibitions, obviously creates um, a lot of other, um, a lot of other risk vis-a-vis -vis the, the em, in employ, employee whose status you're sharing with others. Um, so you do not want to, to say, you know, pull folks together in the office or in a huddle and say, hey, you know, just so you know, Ch Chuck just told us he's COVID positive. So, you know, I'm sorry, you know, you better go and get tested. Um, what you can do without 
giving any names and without giving too much information is trigger the contact tracing protocol that states states have in place. And you do want to make sure that employees understand uh, that that there may have been been an infection, but you're not going to give give any names and you'll try and strike the balance between giving a, you know details so that you know the relevant employees are notified. And sometimes you have to look, depending on the size of the operation, where did this employee work? When did they work? When did they test positive? You know, who was working with them at the time? Um, you know, by the way, it may be it may be not employees. So you definitely cannot share anyone's name, um, but you will have to have to certainly take appropriate steps to make sure that contract contact tracing can begin. So you can share that an infection has taken place, but you can't say it, it was this person. Right. Got it. Got it. So, so last question here, and then um, we'll share some information and, and open it up for any questions. Um, people are returning back to work, right? And you've clearly got a lot of experience in this space. What suggestions do you have from your experience in terms of how companies should phase their employees back into physical workspace? And, and just more broadly, how can employers best support their employees during this transition? So that's a great question. Um, I think almost every employer in America is struggling with this and obviously beyond America. Um, so, you know, I, again, I already mentioned it, but, but I will mention again, you know, it's important to know what protocols you've put in place and make sure that you've put in place all appropriate protocols. Uh, these need to be shared with employees because uh, frankly, I think this is somewhat of uh, a you know, potentially PR campaign to have your employees be comfortable coming back to work. Um, I'll also share that, that I think you, know, you need to, and I know I've already said this in a different context, but you need to talk to your employees and understand um, one, you know, which employees really need to be back and which perhaps don't uh, in the short term. And that could be in the short term, the medium term, or in the long term. And also um, take into account um, who wants to come back. Uh, you know, I know from from my colleagues, some of them are dying to get back to the office because they miss it. Uh, they like the social part of it. They can do their jobs easier. Others, frankly, are probably happier not being in the office um, because they can get their job done just fine without it. And they're sick of spending two to three hours a day commuting. Um, so I think you need to sort of balance, you know, the business needs, um, what your employees uh, want uh, and what they need. Uh, and, and again, really be thoughtful about, about all of these factors in, you know, before you actually say, okay, this is what we're going to do. And this is how we do it. I will share, uh, anecdotal, you know, anecdotally talking to a lot of folks, um, um, who I know who work for a different employers. I think mo most uh, employers that I've heard about are trying to put off bringing people back to work as long as feasible. And a lot of our companies seem to be intent on bringing back people in sort of like a, a you know, like a 50% population sort of approach. Uh, whether it's, it's, you know, we're gonna have a group there three days a week, and then next week they'll be there two days, and they'll end up being there on average two and a half. Um, again, it's going to be very. It's going to depend very much on what type of business you have, and you know, I think. In, but for an office environment, um, I'm seeing a lot of thought given by employers to which employees really need to be at work, and sort of a recognition that we don't need people at work 100% of the time like we previously did. This, this is a, a bit in the weeds, um, but we got this question recently at a town hall and I found it fascinating. So if you have a thought on this, please let us know. Um, we, we talked about whether or not you can require a vaccine as a condition of employment. In some of these more hybrid environments where some people are returning and some people aren't, can you say only our vaccinated employees can come back in person? So you can still work for us, but you have to be remote if you're not vaccinated. Can you get to that level of specificity or is it kind of an all or nothing rule? Um, so, 
like a lot of things in my field, there's there's no rule. Right. Um, I think that's I think that's that's very risky because now you are creating two different employee populations. There's a I think a valid belief that you know hey if if I can't come to work. I don't have the same opportunities for advancement and success that that other employees do. Uh, another thing to keep in mind, and, and the EEOC actually uh, addresses this on its website, um, there, there, there's a legal discrimination uh, framework that's it's called disparate impact. And that's where you have a neutral employer policy that happens to have a disparate impact on protected class of employees. And I think one of the realities of the vaccine is they are much more available to some of us than others. You know, I'm very fortunate. I work for Kaiser and you know, I was able to get vaccinated, you know, vaccinated early and easily. But there's still places in this country where it's very difficult to, to get vaccinated. And they can and these can break down a lot along sort of predictable lines in terms of who's disadvantaged and who isn't. And they, when they break down along lines of race, for example, and you say, hey, guess what? If you're not vaccinated, uh, you can't come back to work. You may be having a disparate impact on employees in certain races. So so I would not be in favor, um, certainly on a permanent basis, of that sort of, of approach speaking very much in the abstract without you know, knowing the employer at issue. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Walter. That is very helpful. I'm gonna pause here and see if anyone has questions, feel free to use hand raise or chat box. Um, while I do that, Ashley, I know Kaiser Permanente has some really great toolkits that they've put together and kind of playbooks for reopening. I know there's one on returning to work. I know there's one on vaccine confidence and I believe there's one on back to school. Um, so if you might share those links, I think those are great resources for folks who are looking for more. Um, just like that, you've dropped them in. The magic of technology, Ashley, well done. Um, so any, any questions, anything we've not gotten to? I think this has been extremely helpful. Anything we're missing for any folks watching? Excellent. Well, that, that would go ahead. Were you jumping in, Patricia? Yes, I do. I have a quick question. So we are a volunteer organization. And right now, we don't have the kids coming to our facilities. But at one point, we will. And so my question is, is can you because I know you can request that they wear masks. But can we ask whether or not they show a proof of vaccination in order not to have to wear a mask? And that's specifically for the, the kids that would be coming in. Well, you're... no, well, the kids would be in there. So the kids will probably will probably still have them um, because they'll be under. It's about whether or not the volunteer Got it. would be able to wear the mask or not. Can you ask volunteers for vaccine status so you know what your mask policy needs to be on that basis? Yeah. Got it. Or do we have to mandate that everybody just wears a mask? Got it. So, so volunteers uh, obviously are not employees. Right. Uh, so, you know, I think I, I think you you, you know, absolutely could could do that again. You look at, you know, does it make sense um, uh, from a business perspective? But, yeah, I don't I don't see any reason why why um, unless maybe you're in Texas um, at this point to uh, go ahead and, and um, ask that. Patricia, was that helpful? Any additional clarity needed on that one? Nope, that was that was exactly what I needed to know because when we start having these kids come back in, I just wanted to make sure that we were on the same page of what is required. Yeah, I think that's such a great question. We're working with a, a theater company that serves young adults and they're having very similar discussions about how do we provide the, the safest environment for the young people who we know aren't vaccinated because they don't have that option yet. So very, very good questions. And then I have one more, but this Please. is more not like not necessarily work related, but I have a question as in, so I also have a child who's unvaccinated right now. So if I am going to work every day and I don't necessarily know if who is vaccinated and who is not in my office, we're just going to allow people to wear a mask if they want and not wear a mask. Would you recommend, because I have a child that is unvaccinated, that I wear a mask in these situations where I don't know? 
with the thought being, am I transferring this when I go back home? Mm -hmm. Dr. Young. That's a very good question. Um, obviously, you don't know what you're exposing yourself to when you go into the public domain, whether or not someone is vaccinated, unvaccinated. Um, as far as we know, based on the recommendations on behalf of the uh, Center for Disease Control, uh, the, the, the recommendation for no longer having to wear a mask in the public domain so long as you're fully vaccinated does take into consideration returning to a household with other members that are unvaccinated. So while you may be concerned about the risk for transmission because you may have contracted it from someone who's unvaccinated and then transmitting it to uh, your child or someone else who's unvaccinated in the household, there is no formal recommendation about having to wear a mask because you're around your child who's unvaccinated. Um, Overall, the risk of transmission is relatively low and there's no specific guidelines recommending that you need to wear a mask when returning to your household. So the, the, if you're vaccinated, it also lowers your risk of transmission. I'm not the medical expert. I wanna make sure I'm not simplifying that, but is that generally- Sure, that, that's sort of the general concept behind the recommendations. Um, whether or not you're vaccinated or you're interacting with people who are vaccinated or unvaccinated. Um, the general premise is that on the basis of vaccination, it lowers your risk for transmission to other individuals. Um, so whether or not you have a child in your household or somebody else who's unvaccinated, there's no clear cut guideline that says that you need to wear a mask or they need to wear a mask when you come home or anything like that due to concerns of transmission. Um, but it's a very good question nonetheless. Um, yeah. Thank you. Patricia, I lead a lot of these vaccine task force and discussions, and that's the clearest exchange I've ever seen on that. When we log off, I'm going to go talk to my wife about it because we've had those same questions. So thank you for asking that. And Dr. Young, thanks again for the clarity there. We got a question in the chat box um, on this topic. Have there been any documented cases of a vaccinated individual transmitting the disease? As far as I'm aware of, I don't think so. I think any sort of instances of this would be anecdotal at this point. Um, we don't have enough data and, and sort of like Mr. Walters alluded to, it's, it's very difficult to trace transmission of infection, um, um, especially in someone who is vaccinated because they may be uh, very mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic in nature. Um, so as far as we're aware of, um, there aren't any confirmed cases that I'm aware of or that have been reported of a vaccinated individual transmitting the infection. Thank you. And, and you got to thank you in the chat box. A great question. You're welcome. <laughs> Good question. Um, I have a, a quick question, um, personal also, since we're all asking these now. Um, my three-year-old daughter is unvaccinated, obviously. I am fully vaccinated yeah. past my two-week mark. Um, and... Uh, she brought home a bug that I caught. i pretty positive it's not COVID, but in the case that I didn't know, should I be, um, you know, going to get tested for uh, COVID or, you know, how, how do you navigate those scenarios where, you know, we might be con getting some regular seasonal bugs and, and how do I know whether to get COVID test or not? Do I go to the doctor's office? Do I put myself at risk or my child or others? Um, how would I navigate that? That's a very good question, um, uh, Ashley, in terms of you know whether or not this is just like a regular common cold or any run-of-the-mill upper respiratory infection versus COVID-19, because obviously the symptoms between them are very similar. Um, Ultimately, I would recommend if you're trying to be prudent for yourself and your family, the best thing to do would be to reach out to your primary care doctor to see what they recommend in terms of a COVID-19 test. Um, we have rapid tests that have, you know, uh, somewhat um, uh, are accurate. Uh, we have the standard PCR-based tests, which um, takes a little longer, but tends to have higher accuracy rates. Um, if there is any overall concern, it would be prudent to reach out to your primary care doctor. That being said, there is some uh, data that seems to suggest that the rate of infection with COVID-19 after becoming fully vaccinated is extremely low. Um, 
so just for some peace of mind, um, it, it seems like you have recovered. I'm not sure how long ago that that infection may have been. Um, by and large, the data seems to suggest that the rate of infection once you're fully vaccinated is extremely low. Um, so just to give you some peace of mind in that regard, that it, it su seems to suggest that it may have been more of a run of the mill upper respiratory infection. But if you ever have any concerns, particularly if there are unvaccinated young individuals or high risk individuals that you come in close contact with on a regular basis, definitely a good idea to reach out to your primary care doctor or uh, seek a COVID-19 test to be sure. Great advice, thank you. It's fantastic. You're welcome. And I, I think it's a very relevant topic broadly as well. We, we did a discussion just recently with a number of university leaders who are, you know, in the fall, people get the flu and colds and strep throat. And so we're going to see a, a huge wave of symptoms and we're going to have to figure out quickly, what are we testing for and where and what does that mean? Uh, masks kept a lot of us safe for non-COVID things this year. So it's going to be an interesting year, I'm sure, Dr. Young. Uh, any closing words for, for the group from anyone? I have found this extremely helpful and I know we, we recorded it as well. So thank you so much for the questions and the engagement. But any last last thoughts? get vaccinated. That, that's that's what I, I think we heard today. Ashley, thank you to the Board of Trade for putting us together. Uh, Mr. Walters, uh, Dr. Young, thank you for sharing your expertise. And thank you all for tuning in and asking great questions. Appreciate you all very much. Thank you, Michael. Thank, thank you, you very much, Michael. Thanks, Michael. Bye, everyone. Goodbye.